from a global, like intergalactic perspective, what are some of the greatest cybersecurity risks we face today, Howard? Well, first, let me, let me say thank you, Sandy, for spending the time. It's great to, to be with the grand dame of information security, the early days of ISSA that we've all received the benefit from. Uh, Godmother, I expect to see a princess dress and a magic wand, and I think Sandy's still working on the magic wand thing. <laughs> Uh, also, thanks the, to the LA uh, ISSA chapter, Stan, David, the whole team. I know we got a few acolytes there in the very beginning. Uh, having been here a number of years ago, uh, not only have I seen the growth, but I also know how much work goes behind the scenes. And uh, so for that team, thank you for the opportunity to, for me to come here and meet with everybody. Now, on to the question. Uh, you know, it's interesting because when you look at the greatest threats, the greatest problems, depends on where you're standing at. Uh, from the government law enforcement perspective, it's cyber criminals, cyber spies, uh, nation states that are out there, uh, defense organizations. I think uh, last count there were about 27 countries that have declared they're doing something similar to what we've done here in the United States and building a cyber command, and hopefully we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so from that perspective, those are the biggest threats out there. The, the actors that are professional that do this on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, whether it's setting up uh, implants into critical infrastructure to be able to use at some point in the future, whether it's currently stealing intellectual property, that's sort of that piece of it. From an end user community village member, uh, you know, issues around cybercrime, credit card fraud, identity theft, uh, financial fraud, these are the things that are the biggest threat and those actors that, that work in that area. Uh, and we have a whole lot of pieces in the middle. Um, and so when you look at the threat matrixes out there, it depends on who you are, where you are, uh, and what the biggest threat is. The one that unfortunately is not discussed much, and this is something that I hope that you as the, the close community that you've got here in, in the uh, uh, LA area, is the small, medium-sized businesses. Okay. Uh, you know, big corporations and, and having served at a couple of them, you know, we had spent a lot of money and continue to do significant investment okay. in protecting large corporations. Governments, I mean, governments throw a whole lot of money, expertise, and those of you that either have worked or work for the government, you know, uh, they can throw all the money in the world at it, but there's only a limited number of security professionals can do the job. And oftentimes in environments where the management doesn't really understand what you do, it's, oh, it's a technical thing, put some antivirus and make it go away. But the small and medium-sized businesses are the ones that are really impacted that I think we need to focus on more. Since we're on that point, then let's, let's pursue that. In the last couple of months, there's been some well-deserved attention to small and medium-sized businesses in the media. In March, the U.S. House Small Business Subcommittee on Health and Technology held a hearing during which a study was cited with the following findings. More than three quarters of small businesses believe their companies are safe from hackers. It's the old, it won't happen to me, right? 20% of all cyber attacks hit small businesses with 250 or fewer employees. 60% of small businesses close within six months of a cyber attack. That's six out of 10, that's a big percentage. Then in April, a Verizon data breach investigations report was released stating that of 621 confirmed data breach incidents they recorded in 2012, close to half occurred at companies with fewer than 1,000 employees including 193 incidents at entities with fewer than 100 workers. So they're small companies. And then a separate report from Symantec confirmed this trend, finding that cyber attacks on small businesses with fewer than 250 employees represented 31% of all the attacks in 2012, up 18% from the same time in 2011. So that's like a 100% increase. And we know, as you mentioned, that these organizations often have scarce resources with little extra money to staff uh, security management or purchase tools and things of that sort. So with all those statistics and the background that you already mentioned, um, what do you think are the most important things that these companies should do um, 
and obviously I think you believe it's a big threat because you already mentioned that. So what can small businesses do? Well, it's interesting because those statistics are very, very uh, uh, revealing to those of us in this business. Unfortunately, they don't migrate to those in those small businesses. The other piece that those statistics really don't then hold out, and uh, when I was at the White House the most recent time, I was dual had it, and effectively I reported uh, to the net part of the National Security Council and also part of the National Economic Council. So I jokingly tell people all the time that I was the one that got to sit in the sit room and be schizophrenic because national security lock it down, make sure this doesn't happen. And on the economic side, no, we need to keep it open and running for businesses. Uh, but one of the things we did a review on is exactly what drives the economy. You know, we hear about the financial sector, we hear about all the, the large multinational uh, companies in this country, but in reality, the vast majority of what builds the economy and provides the jobs in this country are small and medium-sized businesses. So while that doesn't get a whole lot of attention outside of that hearing, that's the things that, that keeps us employed in the economy running. So what are the things they can do? I think we all recognize that in, in, in a vast majority of the small, medium-sized businesses, the office manager is also one that goes to Costco and buys the coffee that uh, makes sure that the phone system is working and all these other things, and oftentimes the system administrator for the network. Unfortunately, they have no training, no expertise in some of the basic stuff that we need, the good cyber hygiene. And I think as professionals, you all know that about 80 to 85 percent of what are successful intrusions in the systems can be prevented just by doing some of the basic cyber hygiene we need to be doing. So one of the things I've recommended in the past to the Small Business Administration is, particularly for small business loans, when they're required to submit a, bus uh, a, a business plan when you go get a small business loan. I don't know if any of you have done that, but it's, it's typical government, 25 pages or so of stuff you can probably do in one page, but that's the way it works. Part of the business plan should be required to get funds is what is your cyber risk profile? What is your cyber security plan? How do you plan on making sure that that single person office manager, that he or she indeed takes care of the small office? The other piece, when, when, you, when you think about small, medium-sized businesses, there's all kinds of things that we, we come to mind. What we oftentimes forget are small law firms, uh, medium-sized law firms, because oftentimes, and, and go back to the large corporation versus small, medium-sized, large corporations generally have you know, top-dollar, high-paid legal staff to help them work through their decision-making but they always run into things that they were not, it's not within their core competency, they don't staff, so they do outside counsel. What happens, they email everything under the sun to outside counsel, <laughs> uh, you know, business plans, uh, you know, issues that they wind up dealing with, so anybody that's intent on going after a big company, they can go after the small legal firm. So as a consequence, when you look at those small, medium size, what indeed is the plan? Are you doing the basic cyber hygiene? I think you guys have uh, in this community here have a lot of here's the top 10 things you need to do. Uh, we see them on Homeland Security's website, FTC's website. So just making sure that the basics are being done Back to is the part basics. of it, vitally important. Absolutely correct. You know, better passwords, uh, encrypting data, like you say, things of that sort. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a, it's a real quick story. I, years ago, I you know had some new went in for my eyeglasses appointment. About two weeks later, I get a letter in the mail from the doctor's office, which was about five or six offices in the Seattle area. That said, we're sorry, our, the computer was physically stolen out of the office. Had your credit card information, social security number, all the other things that you worry about, uh, and they said, you know, basically, we're sorry. So I live pretty close, and I called them up and said, just out of curiosity, was the data encrypted? And the response was, what's encryption? <laughs> I'm trained to do oh. eyeglass stuff. I don't know anything about this. I also run the computer system. So basically, when it goes, the other piece of this is, for those of you that your clients and the people you sell to with the small and medium-sized businesses, help them. Because some basic stuff, strong authentication, so we may not be ready yet and long overdue to go to two-factor authentication, but at least give them some password management tools that they can use that also gives them the ability to, in this case, uh, when I went down to meet with them, the, the password for the, the server was actually underneath the keyboard, no surprise to all of us. <laughs> uh, and basically, when it was physically stolen, that gave access to the bad guys to the entire system. Yeah. Okay, good. 
Uh, let's go up to larger size businesses and, and some issues that they're going to be facing. On February 19th of this year, President Obama issued Executive Order 13636 entitled Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity. It's intended to strengthen the security of the U.S. critical infrastructure by increasing information sharing and by jointly developing and implementing a framework of cybersecurity practices with industry partners. So, first of all, this executive order establishes a new information sharing program to provide both classified and unclassified threat and attack data to U.S. companies. This new program is an expansion of the Voluntary Enhanced Cybersecurity Services Program. And supposedly, it is going to enable near real-time sharing of threat info to assist participating critical infrastructure companies in their own protection efforts. So these services will be offered by the telecom and the defense companies to banks, utilities, and other critical infrastructure companies. And then second, the order directs NIST to work collaboratively with critical infrastructure stakeholders to develop a cybersecurity framework, relying on existing international standards, practices, and procedures that have proven to be effective. So I have a three-part question on this topic. We'll take each part separate. First of all, what's your take on this executive order in general? Yeah, I think in general, it, it's, and I know this is when I left, the president was pretty frustrated with the fact that some of the things that Congress should have been doing from a legal perspective, and, and I'll give you a quick rundown here in a minute of that, just didn't happen. Uh, between the election coming up and all the partisan politics came as a result of that. After the election was over, then it went back to, well, my committee has jurisdiction, so I want to assert this. Uh, we think uh, defense intelligence community should be in charge of cybersecurity for the nation. Others saying commerce uh, and, and through NIST. Others are saying homeland security. So I know it, as we sat there and, and worked through things, there was a lot of frustration. And, and having an executive order which does not have the power to compel private sector, but can actually go out and tell the government at the executive branch, here's what you need to be doing next. So here's, here's with some of the frustration. So when I was appointed in 2009, uh, when I first, my first day in the job, I got a briefing on all these things. Legislative affairs was one of them. And at that point, there were somewhere around 12 or 14 different proposed pieces of legislation across an equal number of committees. Within the first six months of, of the appointment, we were up to 20 some odd pieces of legislation across 20 some odd committees as well. Uh, some of them were helpful. Some of them were really problematic. Some of them were conflicting with each other. Uh, and the same thing, my committee's bigger than your committee. I'm a senator from a bigger state. I have a, a bigger constituency here, so my bill has to go through. Uh, so we went up and, and talked to, the, it, well, I guess Senator Reed's still there, talked to him and said, listen, we are willing to work within the executive branch to give you some proposed legislation to sort of tell you what it is we really, really need. Because uh, you know, there's a saying in DC, and anybody that's ever lived there or worked there probably has heard this before. If you want a law really, really, really bad, you get a really, really, really bad law. <laughs> and we were concerned about that. And looking at some of the languages in there, I mean, it was just absolutely insane, particularly from our professional perspective. So we, after about a year of getting all the government agencies wrestling, who wants this, who wants that, trying to get a consensus built, because that's the way uh, you, know, you work in that environment, we finally gave some proposed legislation. Some of it was pretty cut and dry. That currently, uh, the, the federal cybercrime laws, if someone were to uh, interfere with critical infrastructure, it's no different than somebody hacking into your computer and stealing your credentials. That the penalties were the same. So we asked for enhanced penalties looking to be a deterrent for those that interfere with critical infrastructure. The second piece, organized crime. Uh, I think we've seen over the years, criminals are better organized, but traditional organized crime says, look at the money I can make off of this. 45 million on when this ATM scam, uh, and that's the things that we know about. So enhanced penalties actually add to the Racketeering Influence Corrupt Operation Act, uh, the, the RICO Act, cybercrime, because that wasn't in there. 
Some other things about training. So for those of you that are far more experienced uh, in this business than, than others, to say, okay, listen, we have a CISO from a, uh, a company that really knows how to do this well. Let's do a year tour in the government and somebody from the government in an equal position go to, go to a company. A student exchange programs, what I used to call it inside the White House. That was a piece of it, pretty straightforward. The information sharing, a vitally important piece of it. Uh, and something that really needs to be worked very carefully. Because when you start looking about the government sharing information with private sector, I mean, that, was, that has been a no-brainer since, what, almost a little over 10 years ago when we did the first national strategy to secure cyberspace. That was the cornerstone of it, when it was given to Homeland Security. So that was the, you know, doing that was not a problem. But then getting information from private sector, there are privacy implications. If you're sending data to the government, uh, and it gets to the intelligence community, the law enforcement community. Uh, it becomes sort of a circumvention around uh, the Fourth Amendment and some of the uh, search and seizure laws. So they're carefully crafted. You can have it both ways. You can have where information the private sector is seeing goes to the government so they can sort of better understand what the threats out there from a national security, a public safety, and national economic perspective and still preserving our privacy and civil liberties, which is vitally important. That was in there. The most controversial piece of it, which still exists and in, in it sort of gets into the framework thing, is that the Department of Homeland Security was to work with private sector to identify what is core critical infrastructure. I mean, we all agree that you know, we need to keep the electricity running, but, and I'll use my, my home in Seattle for example. I live up on a mountain. To me, critical infrastructure is about uh, 30 gallons of unleaded fuel and my generator, because we get a lot of storms, so I have electricity. It normally lasts no worse than a week, so I've got the ability to do it. But in the flatlanders where, where people live in the cities, that really can be chaotic. They don't have the generators, they don't have this. So it's different regionally, it's different seasonal, it's different in industries, so it's not as if the defense industrial base is all critical. It's not just all electricity companies are critical. So private uh, Homeland Security Secretary Napolitano was supposed to work with private sector to sort of say, what are the things that we really, really, really care about and can't live without could be on population base. The other thing was then to work with them to using industry standards. The ISO is, is, is what uh, we talked a lot about, the ISO 27000 series, to say, okay, for those of you in this bucket, very, very small bucket, give us some sort of attestation that you're doing good cyber risk that you indeed are looking at the ISO 27000 or the NIST standards, whatever it may be, that's industry best practices around cybersecurity, and let us know for sure you're doing it, voluntary basis. If you don't, there was, our, our version of it was no penalties, no fines or anything else, but clearly it was that if you didn't, uh, you may not be eligible for government contracts, which makes sense. Because if you're using taxpayer money to pay for a service that is inherently not as secure as we need it from an information security perspective, why are we spending taxpayer money on it? So that's a real incentive there. The second thing is you look at the notification would be out there for your business partners and those you do business. And it's just the same thing with any of us. If, if there's a car, and we've seen them over history, there's a car that's inherently unsafe. Once the report comes out, we don't buy it. The third thing is civil liability, and, and as I think most of you know, I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one on television, but I've been around a lot of really smart lawyers in my, in my life, and they say if indeed that you're doing, not doing what you need to be doing in today's era, you might be opening that door that's not been opened before on civil liability. You know, so whether it's downstream liability, whether it's product liability, that door, which has been closed pretty closely for a long time, may open up. Mm -hmm. So there were three sort of voluntary incentives that, that effectively said you should apply. People went nuts over that. Uh, some congressional leaders said, no, that's regulation on private sector. It stifles innovation. And indeed, if not done properly, it could stifle innovation. Uh, but it could also raise the level. So, out of frustration, coming back to the EO, out of frustration, the president says, we need to do something. We need to share information on a near real-time basis, not as we've seen in, in the past, 102 days after the government becomes aware of something. Then you go back to the sector and say, by the way, here's the vulnerability, here's the malware, here's the IP address, 
And so you go protect yourself that we've known about it for 102 days. Flipping that on his head, the default will be you share unless you can give me some good justification why it should not be shared. Somebody's life's in danger, there's an intelligence operation, it's gonna make the world a safer place. If not, it must be shared. So do you think this executive order can really make a difference without the meaningful legislation? Or do you think Congress can ever come to some kind of a decent law that the president won't veto? Um, or is that pie in the sky? I think it's pie. In, well, I think it's pie in the sky until everybody is just worn out by it. And I've seen this also in D.C. You get debating it and arguing and debating. And by the way, this is not new. There's been debates on cybersecurity legislation or information security legislation since back in 1999. Uh, and what happens is it gets kicked down the the. the down the road a little bit, and then things sort of quiet down. There's another big, as they call, a wake-up moment, and then there's a big flurry of activity, and that gets kicked down the, the road. So the executive order can make a difference, but okay. it depends on how much cooperation is going to be with those in private sector that says, yeah, we know how to do this. We, we work with you so you're not putting some unnecessary burden on us that's going to put us out of business. Mm -hmm but also give us the top cover of the benefit of what government can bring to the table, which is a small slice. The law enforcement intelligence community gets to see a lot that, that we don't in private sector, so sharing that will be helpful. So the legislative piece, it ultimately, I think there may be something passed, but it'll be whittled down and, and so uh, uh, diluted that we'll move beyond that as a, as a uh, profession and just say, we can't wait for the government anymore. Okay. And thirdly, NIST has a very large role in this because they're supposed to be developing this cybersecurity framework. I've worked with NIST extensively in my career, and it seems like their funding waffles up and down based on the administration, other federal agency influences, the way the wind is blowing in Washington, et cetera. Do you think there's some, is this a compelling enough driver that will actually give us, the public, confidence that NIST will be able to have a sustainable budget to do the job they're supposed to do. Yeah, and I think the short answer to that is yes. NIST uh, has been, for the most part, free of all that political jockeying going back and forth. I know uh, about a year before I, I retired, uh, we launched this program called NSTIC, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, looking to move into an ecosystem of strong authentication and move away from user ID and passwords and everybody's social security number is also their, you know, so their anchor that we use to do validation of identity management. Uh, there was some jockeying, Congress was getting ready to look at the budget, no one see question was coming. Uh, and we went up and talked to them, and they made sure they allocate, I think it was 27 or $28 million to NIST to fund that office because it was critical enough. So I think if the message is shaped properly, uh, that both sides, uh, including the independent side of, of Congress, says this is vitally important, that NIST do this work, it's vital, it, 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 I think it will continue to move forward. There is a key piece of this that we oftentimes overlook. It's not that NIST is going out to, to create this. It's NIST is working with private sector to build that framework. Uh, so it's not about NIST going out and, and right. making something. Uh, yeah. And that's the thing that will be successful. So quite honestly, the onus is on us in private sector mm -hmm. to make sure that we're supporting what NIST w wants right. to do. And, to support us. Yeah, it's intended to be a collaborative effort. Correct. And NIST is actually and very, NIST, good NIST, yeah, NIST, very good at that. Yeah, NIST, I don't know of any agency in the government that's better at it than mm -hmm. NIST. Okay, so we've just talked about how the presidential order has committed the government to play nice with us and share info with our companies. But flying in the face of that, we read in the media, legitimate media such as Reuters, that the U.S. intelligence and military agencies have become the biggest buyer in a burgeoning gray market where hackers and security companies sell tools for breaking into computers. This is not to protect us against breaking into computers. This is to actually break into computers. And that strategy is certainly raising concern in Washington um, that that Washington, by default, is uh, encouraging hacking and failing to disclose to software companies as well as customers the vulnerabilities that are exploited by these um, purchased hacks. As an aside, I'm having trouble getting my head around this because, you know, on one hand, you know, the government says, oh, we're going to share information with you. And then on the other hand, they're not sharing information because they're buying these hacks. So 
aside from that inconsistency, what message do you think this purchasing uh, does to other countries, especially you know maybe slightly unfriendly ones like Iran or North Korea, or to terrorist organizations? If, if the U.S. is doing it to them, how do we know they're not going to do it back to us? And how do we protect ourselves against you know, blowback from this whole situation? Yeah, and I guess it would be foolish of us to believe just because we can do something that nobody else can do it back to us. I remember probably about 15 years ago, I was with uh, uh, one of the government agencies. I was in, still in private sector at the time, and we were on this uh, mission in a, in a foreign country, and I was walking down the road uh, with one of the people from the ambassador's office said, listen, don't you get concerned that you know, we have all this capability that we've developed, and we have. I mean, we've been dealing with this uh, from the Department of Defense since the early 90s, uh, use of IP-based technologies for national security purposes. But don't you get concerned that we really need to sort of be more inclusive of the discussions on this? And the response was, and, and this is one person, it wasn't the entire government saying this, well, we're so good at it, why would we want to come to discussion with other peace because nobody will ever catch up to us. And you know as well as anybody, if you think that we've got the, corner, the market cornered on security expertise in information security systems, I mean, it's really a flawed philosophy to think that some smart person or a group of smart people or a group of people paid by another country can't do the same zero-day discovery that, that we're able to do. They can't uh, figure out some good way to write a piece of malware that will look like your 2013 pay raise, which most of us know we're not getting anyway, but uh, you, you wind up uh, becoming very, very lost in what, what can really happen out there. So number one, that's, that's a flawed philosophy that somehow we can do it and nobody else can. The, the second piece of this is the merits when we look at if the vast majority of cyberspace is owned and operated by private sector. Uh, the term gets used in the physical world, collateral damage. Uh, we're going to be on the front lines of what governments are doing against each other uh, more ways than we can shake a stick at, which is really, really counterproductive because on one hand we're saying we need to protect them, but the other thing is we become more vulnerable because of what's not being shared. The third thing, and uh, it, it's sort of a, one of my weird things, so I spend a lot of time on planes and I get bored, so I find all kinds of e-books that I can read, generally the free ones, by the way. Uh, and uh, Sun Tzu, The Art of War, if you haven't read it, uh, it it's fascinating to think, you know, centuries and, and uh, uh, millennium ago, you know, all these writings that take play. But what I do is sort of I do my technology twist to it and say, okay, I read this passage and how would that apply in what we're seeing in cyberspace today? So the one I found most interesting, there was a little passage in there about use of fire against an enemy. And so reading that, and, and I'm paraphrasing, this is my own interpretation, says number one, if you're gonna use fire against an adversary, you wanna make sure the wind's not blowing back in your face. <laughs> Pretty solid philosophy. The second thing is, if it indeed is blowing back at your face, you wanna make sure that you have nothing that's flammable. Makes sense. The third thing is, if you have something that's flammable, you better hope it's of no consequence because it's going to burn and you're going to lose it. And, and I twist that around in the cyberspace. If we are writing a piece of malware against someone else with the concept that A, it'll never be found. Secondly, if it is found, it'll never be reverse engineered and used against us. I think that's flawed. The second thing is, if we had no vulnerabilities, you might be able to get away with it. And when I say us, that means democratic nations and those of us right. that, are, that are part of the global economy, et cetera, et cetera, leaving aside some of the rogue nations that we all uh, you know, think should go away in some form or fashion. So as a consequence, to then contract people out, which is one of the things that, that really uh, frustrates us here in the United States, where we go see nation states that go, I'm not going to have my fingerprints on it. I'm going to hire a local company to go out and write the malware to then launch attacks on the US or the UK or Australia, Canada, whatever it may be. And we can sit back and say, not us. Well, guess what? Anybody that does that can sit back and do it. So it's really problematic. And, and I think that's where we, uh, as business owners, as security professionals, as citizens, have to say, now, wait a minute, enough is enough. 
Uh, you're writing stuff that's going to impact us with the concept that it will never be used against you. And guess what? Those that will be used against us are those that depend on technology the biggest, the private sector companies out there. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, now a quick question about who is going to protect our national and corporate data against whatever attacks materialize from whatever sources. Um, we have a number of colleagues here in the audience that are from uh, academia, both teachers and students. In Los Angeles, we're fortunate to have a number of large universities, the um, second largest community college district in the country, both of which are poised to try to train the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. Uh, two parts. One, is the Obama administration doing anything to pump some resources into that? And secondly, uh, what can we do to help get information security talent that is needed? Yeah, I think shameless I'm, plug, I hope, will be yeah, coming it, for it that. It is a, a shameless plug, and, and there's a lot of, lot of really good ones. Uh, one, the ISSA Foundation is a good vehicle. That's the and, one I and, wanted. Uh, uh, you know, Yay. make that very, very clear, and, and it's something that, that I'm happy through uh, Stan and, and uh, uh, David's efforts, you know, the speaker things would go towards that, which I think is, is a wonderful thing. Because we give the scholarships. More. Yeah, the scholarship piece. For the students. Uh, the, the second thing is, as far as what the government did, is actually created a program called NICE, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. We've had the scholarship for service program around for probably about 11 years now, identifying universities and now c including community colleges, which is vitally important. Uh, as part of centers of academic excellence in information security and information assurance. Government pays for scholarships, and with those scholarships, uh, one would then have the ability to get into school, and then after you're done on a two-to-one basis, if you two years of university, you do one year of government service, which is absolutely every student I've met, including some of the universities that I'm affiliated with, uh, they go to the FBI, they go to the Department of Defense, they go to Homeland Security, CIA, during their internship, and they really, really love this work, and it, it helps, but it doesn't scale. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the ISC Squared recent uh, uh, workforce study that shows how dramatically short we're going to be, not only now, but we're going to continue to be. And think of the hours that you work. Uh, it's not as if you have a, what we used to talk in the old day, about a nine to five job and you go home. We're married to our smartphone, our Blackberry, our, you know, our PCs, you know, you're out there at a, at a, and we all are, you know, watching our kids play some sports or swimming or going to a movie and the thing's vibrating and you're trying to do that. Guess what? If we had more people, it probably may take a little bit of pressure off, but it's not there. So we really need to make sure that we have a pipeline in there. What NICE did, in addition to making sure that we had end user education and training through uh, Stay Safe Online, uh, which is a really good program, but also to make sure that we have workforce development for private sector as well as government, determining the needs, what's the curriculum look like, how do we get the tools out there so universities and community colleges and even some cases the high schools through the Cyber Patriot program don't have to go out and design their own. We have tools available to them they can sort of plug and play in our environment. Uh, one of my uh, other uh, hats that I wear is executive director of Safe Code, this uh, software assurance forum for excellence in code because the vulnerabilities we have in software are, are a part of the issues. So Microsoft, Siemens, SAP, Intel, Computer Associates, Adobe created this nonprofit and just last week we released six modules you can download for free on everything from cross-site cross, cross scripting to uh, Windows authentication to uh, file uh, attributes in Linux and Mac. Those are free things you can download, use them for universities. You know, so these are things that I think we need to continue to do uh, to make this part of a career, not just something that we get plugged into. Good. I'd like to open the uh, uh, dais here for questions from the floor. We have some portable microphones that people will run around and find you. Uh, raise your hand high so they can see you if anybody would like to ask a question. Over there, kind of in the center. Did you tell them about the prize for the first question that came to the floor? That was a surprise. Oh, okay. Surprise. Um, hello, my name is Don Turnblade. We, we may have actually met before. We have. Good to see you. Um, when you talked about the NIST soliciting 
uh, industry input. Uh, I've seen a little bit of it, and I actually accidented into the possibility of talking to them. Is there any way in which you would find out more information about how to talk to them and when they're listening, that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question because uh, NIST now has a website set up uh, requesting information. There's two pieces where you get information on this. There's the, the Federal Register, which publishes, it shows the timelines, contacts, email address, and everything else. So if you go to the Federal Register, just search for this term, you can find it there. The other thing is go to NIST Computer Security Division website, and they'll show you sort of when they're having public meetings, uh, when they're, you know, as with anything like this, you can't have a, a group this size try to, to figure out some of these things. So where's the closed meetings where you have the experts come in and sort of work this out? Then subsequently they publish it, then it comes back for comment. And there's normally like 90 day chunks in there is the way that works. Uh, quickest way to do it. And, and from the people that I know that are, are work there on a day to day basis, and I just marvel at their, their dedication and their expertise, they really welcome the input. Uh, and they really like people coming in and say, I can help you. Um, so I, I would suggest hit their website and they really appreciate the expertise. Good question, thank you. Questions, other questions? Hi, Bennett Kelly, Internet Law Center and Cyber Law and Business Report on Webmaster Radio. Um, one of the issues, it seems, on cybersecurity is the lack of a um, free market incentive to invest more in the area because there really is no consequence. And so how do you get to that point where there actually is a, a free market incentive and how does government um, create that incentive without just opening everyone up to vast liability? It's, it's a really good question because that's something that's been debated once again going back to uh, uh, 1998 when President Clinton signed uh, PDD 63, Presidential Decision Directive number 63, that really started to focus on information security and what are the incentives in there. Uh, a couple things uh, that I found that work. I know one of my uh, previous multinational corporation jobs, we actually had a 15% reduction in our corporate risk insurance because we have a viable uh, information security program, you know, I was appointed and then we had teams, we had a business process and the insurance company came in. So the risk management team just absolutely loved it. The CFO loved it because we were able to actually get a reduction in our in corporate insurance. So that's and I one had the same thing at Security Pacific Bank. So going to through the insurance companies yeah. is an excellent idea to try to get some reduction of, of your um, premiums or lower the deductible and things of that sort. Yeah, and it really raises the bar because what happens is when, you, when, you, when that's an incentive, people say, well, gee, we'll do better security. We'll get a cheaper price for our insurance, plus we reduce our risk. So that's number one. Uh, the second thing is, and this is something that, that I think we're just now beginning to focus on, is the C-suite. Uh, everybody in this room is a security professional. I mean, oftentimes, and I apologize for, for using this term like this, but up here talking is like preaching to the choir. You all know this, you know it better than anybody else in, in the world, but as a consequence, when you try to uh, talk to executives in companies or even in government, it becomes, well, this is a technology issue, you know, so well, let's call the CIO and fix it. It's a business issue. So understanding that this has got to be part of the business risk. So we're focusing on business schools and the C-suite, trying to get them to understand that you want the incentive, you'll get better business. You get lower cost in your business. You get uh, lowered risk in your business to do this. A lot of them don't understand it, so that's sort of the other piece we're trying to do is get the C-suite to really understand that not only through one-on-one -on -one contact, you know, Tom Ridge and myself are, are doing a lot of this right now, meeting with them, but also through the business schools. Great. Thank you very much, Howard. Well, the yeah. hook just because yes. we want to make yes. sure you don't miss your flight. Thank, Thank you. you so very much. Thank you.